crazy podcast from Stewart Museum. Uh, my name is Mike Bakoven. I'm the marketing director at Stewart Museum, and I'm here with Rob Nelson. Rob, say hi. Hi. So this is the first one of these that we are doing. Uh, it can be, let, give us just a little bit of background, uh, since this was something that you, I don't want to say came up with, but it's definitely something that you pushed for. So why are we here? What are we doing? Tell us a little bit about what people can expect while they're listening. Yeah, absolutely. So this is kind of the brainchild, I think, of a lot of people who've been wanting to do something like this for quite a, quite a while. We all at the museum love podcasts and love learning and love reading and some of the educational podcasts are where we get the best information. So I think we all kind of jumped at the chance while all this social distancing stuff was going on and people made the move to virtual programming that uh, this would be a great opportunity to kind of implement our own, our own goals that we've been wanting to do for the podcast. So we came up with the idea to kind of do a two segment show where we would talk about late 19th century professions and the, the culture surrounding them. And then Stir Museum's unique in that we have uh, a fully functioning 19th century living history museum called Railroad Town on, on our premises. So we're going to take advantage of that as much as we can and, and interview the interpreters who are as much of an expert on 19, 1890s living as you can find anywhere. So Yeah, and I think it's going to provide a really nice contrast between what, what we're going to try to do, at least in the first couple episodes of the show, is talk to the interpreters, get the history, get some of that uh out in front of you and then talk to how it informs what's happening right now in our town. Uh, we are coming to you live from Grand Island, Nebraska. We do sit on uh, about 200 acres. If you've never visited the Stewart Museum, there is so much to see and do out here. And of course we want to use this as a promotional vehicle, but we also, you know, we work here because we're interested in this stuff. We work here because we're crazy about this stuff. So, uh, that that's kind of my thought as to why, why we're jumping into this and why we're doing what we're doing. And we, I feel like we would be doing this anyway. Yeah. We're, we all really like history. You could find any of us on a given day just sitting around nerding out on some random topic from either the archive or, you know, an artifact that we found on our grounds or something like that. So yeah. we're, so, really, we're really looking forward to this. And so for our first one, we're going to do one on barbering, of all things, which is, <laughs> which is something you, you might not seem right off the top of your head like something you want to... Uh, to talk about right off the bat, but man, is there a fascinating history when it comes to that stuff? Absolutely. The 1890s barbershop, you know, is the thing that we kind of focus on at the museum, but the history of barbering goes back centuries and even millennia. There's, you know, there were barbers in ancient Egypt, for, for instance, and all the way up until now, and, and the role that, the, that that person played in society has changed. And, you know, it's been a up and down roller coaster in terms of what they did and how they did it and how they were perceived by their societies as well. So, well, I certainly need a haircut. So, you know, let, let, let's get there. Uh, the first segment is going to be uh, you talking with uh, Casanova, who is our director of interpretive resources, and we'll talk a, a little bit about the history and then we will talk to some modern folks. So, if you like this podcast, if you have suggestions for us, if it inspires you to talk about history at all, we would love to hear from you on our. Uh, on our website, uh, stewartmuseum.org, on our social media, anywhere that you can find a podcast or find a way to reach out, we would love to hear from you about what we're uh, what we're doing here today. So let's uh, let's take it away with you, you and Taylor. What do you say? Yeah, absolutely. start off by talking about some some artifacts that would have been found in the 1890s 1890s barbershop and uh, Stir Museum actually has one of those barbershops on our grounds. Yes we have the Elfman barbershop uh, it, that uh, it, structure has a, kind of a muddled history uh, it was one of three structures that was on North Pine Street uh, in Grand Island at uh, notoriously or maybe not notoriously might have been moved around a couple times but it came to the grounds in uh, the 1960s uh, and was among uh, some of the first buildings that were put in Railroad Town at that time. Uh, but it was first interpreted, the structure was first interpreted as a mercantile. And then later on, it was, uh, they converted it to a barbershop once they had the donation from the Elfmans for the barber uh, items that are in the shop now. Um. Maybe we could talk about outside the barbershop before we uh, go inside the barbershop. Probably a good idea. 
Yeah, I know we have a uh, our own version of a barber pole that's that sits outside of our barber shop in Railroad Town. Um, I I compiled some some history. I think the barber pole is just a really really cool piece of history. Um, so maybe we could just get into that and talk about it a little bit. I'll tell you what I found, and you can <laughs> correct me well, if I'm wrong or add or on or detract. What I know about the the specific barber pole that we have now is that one was based on. Uh, a photograph that I believe is in the museum collection and so it depicted that particular style of barber pole and that was recreated by a former uh, education director to put in front of that shop way back in the earlier part history of the museum. So it's unique to a specific photograph. I do not know what that photograph is though. Sure. And our, our pole has red, white, and blue stripes, correct? Correct. And for those of you who don't know, the, the barber pole has a lot of symbology in it that dates back several hundred years, back to the time before barbers only cut hair. Uh, that was only one of many things that, that barbers did from the, I think, 12th century to the 18th century. They were primarily, I mean, they cut hair and shaved whiskers, but they also, you know, did amputations and set dislocated arms and shoulders and pulled teeth and... Where the pole comes into this is actually bloodletting, which was a popular practice up and until the late 18th, early 19th, maybe. Into the, into the early 19th century, yeah, phlebotomy, as it yes. is also called, uh, was practiced by barber surgeons. And uh, there are artifacts that you have uh, illustrated on some of our um, artifact of the days, uh, a fleen uh, that yes. would do some of that cutting. And the barber pole is directly linked to that particular practice of bloodletting because uh, the symbology of the structure of the barber pole with the different colors, uh, the red for the blood uh, uh, wrapped arm, the pole, actually there was a staff that the, the patient held while that process was going on. The top of the um, pole is supposed to be a brassy color to symbolize the bowl that caught the blood. Uh, and then the white is supposed to symbolize the clean bandaging afterwards. Yeah, and these were actually stored outside of barbershops um, as, as an advertisement before there was actually a physical pole that was put out there. Um, it was essentially just an instrument that was put in the window or outside to show passersby that this service was provided at that institution that they would have the um the physical pole standing there but then the yeah the the cloth that would be a tourniquet that would go around the elbow was wrapped alongside the pole and yeah the red comes from the blood the white comes from the tourniquet and, and early on they even hung the bowl out on the pole yes. in between times too uh, and the, the symbology, well, the, actually the pole itself also is a part of the early signage where a lot of people couldn't read. And so you would have a structure thing like a boot for a shoe shop or things like that. So the pole is, is very much part of that. And, and, you know, like most people are, are familiar with the red and the white. And that's where that comes into play. But there's also a variation of the barber pole that has a blue stripe as well. The barber pole that we have out in Railroad Town at Stir Museum has blue. And, you know, this this tradition dates back several hundred years, even to before the foundations of America. And we adopted that. And I think it was Americans specifically added the blue stripe to their barber poles as a patriotic flourish to go alongside of the flag. And the top of our barber pole, if I'm not mistaken, has a star on it. Um, at the top as there's, well. I think there's a star on the top. I, I just looked at it the other day and I can't remember what it, what it has yeah. on it. I know there's a star on it and that there's the, the it's red, white, and blue. Yeah. So, the, I mean, there's just tons of stuff that we, we're, we're going to get into. And that, that, so the, the barber pole is, is, a, is a cool one for me, so I definitely wanted to, to talk about it. But maybe we could, why don't we, why don't we go inside the barber shop now and talk about uh, some of the other artifacts that we have in our collection. We start with the, we have a cabinet that would have well, been used. Yeah, it's a work stand, and that, that's kind of one I have thousands of favorite pieces out here. Uh, but it's a favorite piece because it was being misinterpreted uh, 
use in another location and when we researched the piece we actually found out that it was specifically a work stand for a barber shop and so we got it moved over to the barber shop uh, where it's actually interpreted correctly now. What kinds of things would have gone in this cabinet? Well the really neat thing is there's, there's two drawers at the top there's a center section uh, that's a nice clean area and at the bottom there is and it opens towards the front of you There's a screen in the bottom and there's a lot of airflow in it So the top with the locks on the drawers would be where you could put such things as razors scissors and that type of thing Because that would be a very important part of the barber trade and you wouldn't want anybody to just necessarily walk off with those the center section you would use to store your uh, supply of towels and the lower section you would most likely, but we, I, had, I don't have firm documentation on this, would be where you would put the soiled or already used towels. Yeah, and uh, soiled and used equipment is definitely an interesting part of the barber craft and history yes, as well. Yes, it is. Um, just in doing my own research, uh, it wasn't really until the 1890s that you really start seeing a lot of, you know, cleanliness and sanit sanitary practices starting to take place. One one razor would be used uncleaned to cut everyone everyone's face in the same day and then maybe one towel would be used continuously for 12 one 15 patients. Yeah, one account I I found said that uh, you would use one towel for every 10 to 12 uh, customers which today would horrify anyone, uh, especially today. Uh, but back then, it was just common practice. The other thing that was, you know, at, at one point, the soap was commonly used. And uh, the brushes the, to, to lather, uh, the razors, the strokes, uh, and the things like the alum or styptic pen, which yeah. would kind of stop the bleeding. They would be commonly used. I know it was a it was a belief at this time, you know, prior to the you know twentieth century that it was the soap that was causing a skin irritation. Yeah, barber's itch. Barber's itch, and it actually it wasn't the soap though. It, that that turned out to be wrong. It was the razors, razors yeah. that weren't being cleaned in between use, and that was giving people the irritation. And it's just so crazy to think about that you yeah, know how far one we've come. Record I saw said, "Oh, just wipe wipe it off on paper in between," and. Uh, if you think about blood transfer of anything oh, yeah. now that we know so much more about why this would be a bad idea that uh, when you think about those practices back then, it's a little scary. Yeah, I mean, my immediate instincts just go to, I, I start thinking about the Civil War with amputations and then the surgeons there just kind of wiping their hands off and just sending the next one. Yeah, not even and, not washing hands or anything. And they went to the, maybe a little bit off topic, but they went, People chose to go to the surgeon that had the the bloodiest apron on because he was clearly the good one, you know, because most people trusted him to do an amputation. So, yeah, I want that guy. Never mind that <laughs> he hadn't cleaned his apron all day long. But, uh, yeah, that's just that's just great history. I love it. Well, during the Civil War, you actually saw, saw in, in the barbering trade, you saw a rise in hair care or hair dressing and a lot less because beards became more fashionable. It was easier to take care of them. So you have have less shaving and more hair care starting to rise up at that period of time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and that's something I'd really like to talk about um, in our next segment with our, our, our trained barber who's coming in about different hairstyles and the trends that kind of come and go and how barbers have, have adapted to that. Um, we kind of talked about the some of the other accessories in the barbershop. Um, I know we want to talk about shaving mugs. Those have an interesting history as well. Can you shaving tell us a little bit about those? Shaving mugs are popular because there's just so many of them. There's probably millions of shaving mugs out there that are considered highly collectible, but they really didn't start coming into common use until the 1870s. Uh, and then you get the shaving mugs that start getting decorated and uh, one of, one of the mugs that's in the shop that we have down there has, has pretty pink flowers on it. But then we have another one that has a name on it. And the name is a personalized one. And you could get something like that from the barber. But you could also order things like that from the Sears and Roebuck and the Montgomery Ward catalog. So you, you could get them from a lot of different ways. 
uh, barbers would sell them to ensure, or at least to try to ensure, that that customer would return, especially the personalized ones. And then there, there are ones that, um, I, I, I understand the, the uh, popular ones are, have the trade, yeah. like a uh, railroad engineer, that sometimes they would have fraternal organizations. Um, uh, we made uh, a reproduction one once for a friend that had flamingos on it because flamingos drove him crazy. So we, just, <laughs> we put his name on it and pink flamingos. Um, so it's kind of fun to, to do things like that. Yeah. But to have the, per you, you, it was supposed to ensure that the soap, the brush, and the mug were only used for that particular customer. Yeah, again, trying to keep sanitary, although they were mistaken that it was the soap that was yeah. the culprit of, of those. But I mean, it's easy to see why this would have become, you know, a social gathering for men folk during the time because just kind of keep this in mind, you know, in the, in the 18, in the 1890s, um, you're not necessarily just going to have hot water on tap in your own house. Probably more than likely you need to get it from some outside source, like a well, and then you'd need to bring it inside and heat it often on a, or sorry, boil it on a, what you would probably have would be a wood burning stove. If I'm not mistaken, a wood burning stove, or there were some systems that were boiler system uh, that, uh, especially as you get towards the the last part of the 1890s, where you have more boiler systems for heating structures and things like that, you could have a boiler system for. They would have that for the hot water bath offering that they would have because uh, that was a thing at barber shops. Yeah. Uh, and then that also supplied the hot water for the the patrons for, and basically the hot water was used to clean the the brush that would put the lather on. You know, it would have been a lot of work on a yes. daily basis to just try to do this, something today is as simple as washing your face, or sorry, shaving your face, where instead you could, if you if you could afford it, just walk on down to the barbershop and have them do it twice, three times a week for three to ten cents, I think, or some of the figures I've yeah, seen. Yeah, it's up to ten cents. It depends upon what time period you're you're talking about. I've seen as three three cents, but I've seen seen much more. Uh, you touched on um, men in the barber shop and that was considered a ladies free zone sure uh, in fact it was would be unseemly for a lady to go to a barber shop barbers would take care of women's hair but they would go to the lady's home in order to dress her hair there but men felt safe that they could discuss topics that they would not necessarily discuss in front of ladies while they were in a barber shop uh, and they would they would share that back and forth. You might find a few copies of the Police Gazette with some of the sordid <laughs> stories in it and things like that as well. Yeah, and I'm sure the language wasn't exactly prim and proper as well. I'm, I'm sure that was a same. Probably safe felt a little bit more freedom to uh, <laughs> use uh, colorful language. Yeah, um, that that's going to start to change though. Once you get into the 20th century, um, I, I was new to this to this topic up till. A few weeks ago, but I started really delving into it, and there's a lot of interesting history that's written about early 20th century barbering, and especially when women be start to become active members of the workforce in this industry, um, and es especially when you talk about certain haircuts and the impact that they had. You might not think about something like the bobbed haircut having a massive impact. Yeah, a massive impact on barbering. Absolutely. Um, I have some statistics from the you know from the labor department that say something to the effect of in 1870 1500 women were in the industry of you know being a beautician a manicurist a barber um, during that time 1500 by 1940 there were 218,000 women in that profession and that 85 percent of that growth came after 1920 and that's directly attributed to the bobbed haircut in, in America and the, in the influence that that had on the women of this country. You don't think of a haircut as being a life-changing event, but it certainly was in this particular case. Uh, women were barbers. There were occasions of women being barbers in the 19th century, uh, but often uh, the newspaper accounts that I tracked down uh, last night, a lot of times they would um, kind of not be very nice um, uh, to to uh, women in there. Uh, one article that occurred in the 1883 Omaha Bee it was uh, titled Lathering Ladies, A Barbarous Experience. 
Um, the uh, Mrs. Miss Simmons in February of 1895 opened a shop opposite the Burlington Depot in Lincoln, Nebraska. But she was having evidently boyfriend trouble. She was trying to escape a boyfriend. She had come from Chicago. And so they were reporting on that. And then the 1895 September Sioux County Journal reports that female barbers are not having much success as gentlemen do not want them to want to go to them because they dislike to be cut by a lady. So, uh, and even uh, there was a lot of snide commentary towards women barbers and men didn't feel comfortable around them. So they, the reports were exceptions of kind of the mistrust that they felt about a woman can't handle this yeah. type of thing. And I know that it started out with being, you, you know, once this bob haircut in the 1920s starts to, starts to catch on, I know a lot of women who were barbers weren't comfortable participating in that sort of social progress of cutting women's hair um, short. And they didn't necessarily even have the tools in their parlors to cut short hair because they had shears that they were used to cutting long hair with. But oftentimes women felt they had to go to men's barber shops because those barbers had specialty scissors and different, you know, size clippers and blades and, and things like that because you have to really be kind of detailed in the back especially with that bob with that bobbed haircut but yeah because it's a really close cut but uh like a lot of things the young ladies led the way in that because they wanted those specialized cuts uh there's one the object the straight razor i think is is we have to talk about it so much you know about being a barber had to do with shaving not just cutting hair for for so long um and what i found is that even as far back as 100,000 BC, there is evidence of bar, like not necessarily barbering, but of people during that time using sharpened clamshells or stones of that nature and using those to, to cut their faces of, of chin whiskers. I'm wondering if there's any living history site that does a reenactment of that. I, I, I hope. Like to, I would like to see if there's any gentleman who would be willing to sit through that particular thing. I'm just imagining the uh, dullness of the clamshells and how that would feel against the skin. I imagine it would work. It probably wouldn't be very efficient. Yeah, pro probably not. I do know that there's a there's a direct correlation to um, kind of the die off of barbers performing shaves for customers and the the introduction by the Gillette Company of the safety razor. Yes. Um, and that kind of it coincides with World War One as well. Um, I know men were keep were trimming their beards to keep gas masks gas masks because they, they had sealed. To fit. Yeah, they had to fit snug to the face, so they had to remove the facial hair. Yeah, so coinciding with facial hair kind of going out of vogue and the mass production of the new safety razor, I think, that came out as early as 1903 on a large scale, that really spelled kind of the end of the, the straight shave by, the, by your local barber. You could do it at home by yourself. Exactly. You didn't have to pay somebody to do it. It saved time. You saved money. So why not do that? Uh, all it, it's, it's funny how these little incremental changes actually have a huge impact on how we do our day-to-day -day lives. Yeah. I have one quote I'd like to say from Gillette himself when, he's, when he was trying to, to pitch this new safety razor. He said, if all the time, money, energy, and brain power, which are wasted in the barber shots of America, were applied in one direct effort, the Panama Canal could be dug in four hours. And isn't that a salesman for you? That, and yes, yes. Uh, must be why it's still so successful today. Exactly. I, I wanted to read this poem that, that really kind of stuck with me when I was doing research over the last couple of weeks. Um, and it just kind of speaks to all the, the different things that barbers did over time. And you know, today we think of them obviously as just being people who cut hair, but for several hundred years, that was only one thing amongst many that they did. So this poem just kind of illustrates that. Uh, it's not very long. It's, it starts with, um, his pole with pewter basin hung, black rotten teeth in order strung, rain cups that in the window stood, lined with red rags to look like blood. Did well his threefold trade explain, who shaved, drew teeth, and breathed a vein. I, I don't know. I read that and I thought that was that was pretty neat. How it just kind of talked about, you know, how they pulled teeth and and. It, it sums up the bar, barber surgeon. It really sums it up in a really nice way. Absolutely. Um, 
I, I was I was wondering, I know we kind of already talked about um, how the barber surgeon in, in terms of the bloodletting and those sorts of things kind of, kind of dies out in the early 19th century. Um, I actually did some research and found that some of these practices were still happening as late as 1954 in Melbourne, Australia, where an article from the Australian Broadcast Network that I found um, talked about a man who owned a barber shop there who was still pulling teeth in 1954. So it, it had, it, you know, it, it certainly endured a little bit, at least in small communities throughout I, the world beyond that. I think a lot of times the, it, if they felt that somebody, they knew that somebody could handle a situation, especially when you have a very rural area and you don't have somebody who specializes in a whole bunch of different things, that would certainly be the case. Um, with the phlebotomy, you know, there's the side thing of applying leeches, which kind of does the same thing as the bleeding. And now there, today there's the medical practice of using um, uh, leeches as well. So things keep, they keep yeah. evolving. Yeah, what's that uh, Walt Whitman? I think it's Walt Whitman, the expression, uh, history doesn't repeat itself, but it like has a mirror image or something like that, or, or it has a great memory, I think, yeah. is what it is. Yeah, that sounds about right. Well, I think... That's a good stopping point. I'd like to thank Case Nova for joining us today on this episode of the Stir Crazy Podcast. I knew this would be fun. I, I enjoyed it. I hope you come back. I hope we have several more episodes to come. I had a great time. Today's podcast is brought to you by AJ Sousa Shoe Shop, located on South Front Street in Railroad Town, Nebraska. If you want fine dress shoes, Made to the latest fashions, don't miss inspecting our stock. Shoes remade to fit your needs at prices most reasonable for your purse. Remember, Sousa Shoes in Railroad Town. So right now we are going to talk to uh, Art Anson. Now Art has been a barber in Grand Island where Stewart Museum is for a long time. I, I think he said 43 years, is that right? That's right, I think he may even have been 44 with his education. Yeah, <laughs> so Art is a character, he's gonna be, it, this conversation was a lot of fun, I had a lot of fun doing it. Here's our conversation with Art Anson. Come here, Barber, Studio Art speaking. Hey, is this hey. Art? This is he. Hey Art, this is Mike Bachoven with Stewart Museum Calling. Hello there, Mike. Hey, well, I'm here with uh, Rob Nelson, who's one of our curators. Hello. Okay. And, uh, yeah, we appreciate you doing this. Thanks for taking the time. Well, thank you. I mean, we'll just dive right in if that's if that's okay with you. That's fine, okay. Cool. So can you tell us the name of your shop and how long you've run it and just a little bit about kind of where uh, where you are here in Grand Island? Okay, I'm at uh, Premier Barber Studio, and I opened in January 3rd of 1990 in the Grand Theater. In 1993, they remodeled the theater, and I lost my space, and I moved to 3rd and Elm Street um, in what had been Bud and Bill's Texaco gas station years ago, and I've been here since in this location, but I've been downtown since 1990. Well, what bums kicked you out of the Grand, man? That's terrible. <laughs> well, they were bums. That's terrible. They wanted to update. <laughs> they had the ADA. They had to get the restrooms out of the basement, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm wondering how how the business was. Did you catch a lot of people coming after after they got out of the movie? They just stop in and get their hair cut? Too? No, not really. They um, I've always been an appointment shop, so that didn't really uh, affect me much. Of course, the movies are mostly in the evening. Night close at six p.m., so uh, never really caught that many. Maybe a few that would be at one time. They had senior day once a month with five points bank i believe and i might have somebody stop in then if i had time to do them but most time no it didn't give me really much uh customers <laughs> from from the theater so and you know the smell of popcorn never hurt anything oh yeah and that came through that permeated the walls matter of fact i could <laughs> hear the the movie and my my toilet was in the back of the shop right on the curve going into the the theater auditorium there and i could hear the movie and i always was thrilled when they had their children's movies on wednesdays in the summertime and they have the kids movie and you could just hear the roar of the kids <laughs> it was fun it was fun but 
uh, yeah, permeated smell of popcorn. So, hey, hey, Art, um, how did you how did you get into the profession, and like, what what's your background that kind of drew you to the okay barbering uh, craft? I have a cousin that that uh, went to barber school back in the early '60s, and he always was Art, go to barber school, go to barber school. Well, I didn't really think about it when I graduated high school in 1973. My hair was on my shoulders, and yeah. we didn't go to barbers, and uh, so I just went to work and worked for three years and, and uh, finally decided to working in a factory watching a conveyor belt full of candy coming at you. <laughs> uh, I was going to do something else, so I applied and got into barber school and been, been here ever since, <laughs> 44 years. Did, did you go to school here in Nebraska or did you go out? Yeah, there? I went in Lincoln, uh, Lincoln Barber College, which was, at the time I went, they had just merged with, and they were the first one in the United States to merge beauty and barber together oh. in Lincoln. It became the University of Hair Design, which today is called College of Hair Design for the fact they had so many coincidences with the university name on there in, in the University of Nebraska sure. in Lincoln. So they changed to college, but yes, I went to Lincoln Barber College, so. What kind of uh, you know curriculum did you did you go through? Was it a couple of years and it was like no, it's it's just it was uh, they required us the state required us to have nineteen hundred and eighty hours, and they required because it was a combined beauty and barber, and the beauticians had to have a twenty one hundred hour course. So we had a twenty one hour course, a year course, and and they started new classes every three months. Then so graduated three or a class, and then new class started every three months. So. And, uh, but it was just one year. But they touched on all the aspects of barbering. Plus, then we did have accounting, and that was brought in through the University of Nebraska. And we had a little bit of psychology course. Uh, you know, so. Yeah, and uh, people tell their barber everything after all, so why not? <laughs> yeah, I imagine that comes in handy. Yeah, yeah, I do hear hear a lot of things. So. <laughs> But my customers, like I say, too, have always been my friends, too. I have a sign hanging in here, and it says, friends gather here, and that's yeah. the truth. Well, you said that uh, when you started off, your hair was down to your shoulders. I know a lot of young people can relate, you know, in the, the 70s and 80s and 90s, but have you seen things change up? Uh, oh, yeah. Often? I mean, it, that what people want has changed, and how have you seen that change in your career? Well, I've, I've seen it like when we started. When I got out of school, I barely touched a pair of clippers. It was all sheer cut, layering, shag cuts, uh, feathered cuts, uh, you know, long hair. And uh, then it continually graduated up to shorter hair. And, and probably in the 90s, when you started to see more of the, the real clipper cut come back in, uh, and flat tops and tapered cuts, and, and which has graduated now to everybody wanting the fade cuts and the modern look. You uh, you mentioned a couple ways that like your profession has changed over the years. You know you've changed locations and um, there's kind of trends that have come in and out of style. And um, you know the barber college merged with start, or started getting into the the be- the beauty aspect as well. Um, are there other ways that you know you've noticed the the barbering profession kind of changed since you got on board and involved with it? Well, it was. We were really at a, a changing time when I went into school. The, even like my cousin getting out in the early 60s, he had no styling classes, just all, and it was like a six month course, just all clipper cut, sheer cut, short cut. And then the longer hair came in. So during my time, you know, it really had a large change over to men's styling. And, and uh, you know, that's like a time when you used to see all the Roffler signs on all the shops in Grand Island. And, and the Roffler style and products and things came into real popular with the longer haircuts. Uh, you know, but then now we see it, it's going back the other way and, and trending that way. But another thing I've also seen on it's sad is the trend is that we have less and less barbers. There's probably two thirds of the barbers that were here when I first started in Grand Island in 1977 with drive-in barbers. Uh, there's just that many fewer, uh, two thirds of them are gone that were here. And there's, you don't see the barber, you see the, the super cuts and the yeah. quick cuts and, yeah. and uh, uh, cost cutters, and they're all a franchise, but they're all under the beauty license. Uh, the, and they're graduating so many beauty students every year that they 
plague the field. They they graduate enough to replace every working chair in the state of Nebraska with the cosmetology or beauty license. But but they're really taking over for the barber and the barber industry is really. I don't know. I don't know what we see in the future with it. I, I know in the cities, the comeback is with shaves and, and different things, and these fade cuts are going more with a barber logo, but we'll see. <laughs> yeah. You were talking about shaving. That was part of uh, some of the history that we found there uh, when we were talking about it with, with some of the folks here. Uh, is that something you ever did and anything you were trained to do? Well, this is it is unique. Um, when we were in our last weeks of school and basically almost like the last couple of weeks there we had a crash course on it they had not had it on their curriculum uh for several years because it had been dropped from the state board well they put it back on the state board and in, in uh, 1977 so we had a crash course on it for two weeks and and uh you know, it's a technique that it takes a lot of, of work. It takes a lot of time and, and effort and skill. You, you have to really do them a lot, you know. So we really, you know, even when I got out into the shop, we didn't do shaves at the shop, although I did do a few. I, uh, he still had a lather machine there, and, and I had my straight edge, which by that time we'd come from stropping and honing and sharpening your straight edge to a changeable blade straight edge, which I always laugh because I had a customer come in at Drive-In Barbers in probably about 1977 with a full beard, and he wanted it all taken oh, off, boy. so <laughs> I cut it off and I gave him a shave, but I cut myself changing the blade in, oh, the, in the razor, and I always laugh at him he still comes in i said it's where you didn't get up and run from the chair here i was bleeding <laughs> i was gonna that was another question i had was it, it had to be intimidating the first you know few times that you would have that you have done that doing a straight razor i mean holding up a, a razor blade to somebody's throat i mean that's very nice. intimidating yeah. <laughs> yeah you got a knife in your hand and then uh you know um and we started off with the practicing even on each other. We we did it with just a practice razor, which wouldn't, was not a sharpened blade in the style of a safety razor. But you know, there's always there's like four handholds on the razor. There's 14 movements of the shave across your face with the different parts of your face and all that. I always laugh. My first one, I'm sure that I had the book sitting there on the counter and and read step for step as I did that shave. No <laughs> but, shame but yeah. That, yeah. I never felt confident with it, but we never practiced it much. I probably did eight shaves in my whole career, and the last one was with a buddy in about 1983, I think I gave him a shave. So, a few times you've mentioned just kind of Nebraska regulations in, in terms of barbering. Um, are there unique aspects of the barbering laws in Nebraska that make you know Nebraska stand apart from other states? You know, I don't believe, although now some of the, the videos I have watched, and some of them are out of like Austin, Texas, and and uh, they put the cape on, they do not put a paper strip around their neck. Well, that's law here in Nebraska, so evidently it isn't in Texas, and, and uh, oh, different things. Now, this is kind of a unique thing, is that I see them using the old uh, feather brush to brush the hair off the necks, and the... the I forget what they're actually called, like a neck duster, I guess they were called, but uh, sure. we cannot use those. We have to use vacuums, and, that, oh. and that's a unique thing, too, is I worked at Drive-In Barbers, and we had moved to Eddy Street in 1983 and started employing uh, beauticians with the barbers because we couldn't get barbers, so they were in one part, and we were in one part, and separated by swinging doors. And was, but they got to use the vacuum, but it, by law, they can't use a vacuum in a beauty salon. So if you go into a lot of these shops and they don't vacuum you, that's a difference. But And that's, I don't know, evidently that's a difference with some states. Like I said, watching these films from Austin, Texas, where they're using a neck duster instead of a vacuum. And, that's, you know, so. that's so quirky that it would be that, you know, precise. Quirky, it is quirky. Yeah. It just... Uh, They've always thought that at one time, and I think that's probably sooner than later, they will combine the the industry into just one, you know, hairstyling uh, type system instead of beauty and barber. Yeah. But, so uh, when we were talking yesterday, I got the impression that you knew a little bit about the history of barbering and, and uh, that sort of thing. 
Um, does it kind of feel like you're like you're part of that, even though you know you you've never uh, had to use ever cut anybody and you know bleed them into a towel or anything like that? <laughs> you, you know, I you think there? I think it it all kind of goes back to connecting with with the barbers prior to to us and way back, I suppose that uh, you know I mean it goes way back to Alexander the Great with their cutting and, and stuff. But I don't know if I relate to them, but. I certainly probably relate to the old barbers that I would have known from had got out in the 1930s and started barbering, you know, or the stories of the old barber back in my hometown, you know. So, you know, that was something unique. I had a shop in Greeley, Nebraska for a while, and the barber had retired in 1978, and uh, I had a good friend from there said, Art, come to Greeley and cut hair. We don't have a barber. Well, I went up and opened a shop in his shop that walked in. There's no toilet facilities, but there is a bathtub. <laughs> Oh, yeah, and they used to have people come in and take a bath and get a shave and a haircut. And I suppose some old farmers or businessmen would come to town, you know, and stay in their hotels and maybe come in and take, get a bath. And But they had no toilet. They had an outhouse. But we put in restroom facilities and got rid of the bathtub. But, you know, so things like that have changed over the years. But. Yeah, they were uh, maybe likely to even get their teeth pulled. Oh, you know, yeah, the dental, the dental and, and bloodletting, of course, which was, they thought got rid of the disease by, you know, whatever, <laughs> getting it out of you. It's almost like having a ghost inside your body and draining <laughs> it out. And so very, <laughs> I don't know, not real cool, but yeah, they did dental work also. And then it started, I don't know. Probably in the 1800s went more to just into the barbering and and uh, I know like the state of Nebraska I was just kind of looking at my book and kind of getting a little memory and and uh, they passed the state barbering law and licensing law here in Nebraska in 1927 I think it was yeah and it was put into effect in 1928 so we were a little later the first one was in Minnesota. Uh, back in the 1800s. Yeah, I think 1897 was Minnesota. Uh-huh. Yeah, 1897, there it is right here. So Nebraska was a little behind the curve before that, you know. To, but I know I've talked to different old boys that maybe they worked in the barber shop and cleaned and swept up the hair and helped them get ready for shaves and stuff, but never went into barbering then. But I had never cousins. My, as I said, my cousin Barber in Columbus always was persuading me to go to barber school. And his boys used to go down on Saturday and shine shoes there in the, the mid 60s to early 70s when people wore Oxfords, and so they'd make a little extra money during the daytime. But that's something that's gone too. You don't hear a shoe shines. Well, it sounds like you've. Uh, last thing I was thinking is that you've done this for what 40 some years. 43. Went 44 with the year of school, which I count it because I said we probably cut as much hair in that year as I do in the shop. We were very busy there with college students on budgets, and we had families. A lot of families came in. Yeah. Well, there must be something about it that's kept you doing it for 43 years. Do you, any thoughts on what that is? I just besides giving a, a haircut and like to cut hair, but the people, the customer, you know, I really relate with my customers. And, and uh, you know, it's like oftentimes I might have a customer in the chair and the next customer will come in and be waiting for me to finish that one with the appointment. But I try to include both of them into a conversation and you get to know people, you know, and, and stuff. So that's a lot of it, just the people, just Absolutely. the people. That's great. Cool. Hey, well, we really appreciate you taking the time, Art, and uh, yeah, it was it was a pleasure talking to you. And, and man, you've got uh, you've got some Grand Island history there, I think. I do have some Grand Island history, and I've you know, that's another thing. I've had some of the old boys, and I've had like a couple of them were police chiefs here way back in the '40s and '50s, and then '60s, and then had one old boy that he, he grew up with his dad owning the Fourth Street livestock market, and he talked about herding cattle down Coney Street out to oh the railhead on Webb Road uh, where they had the loading chutes and stuff to, from the sale market. So it's a, good old you know, a lot of history. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Hey, well, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank you. You're very welcome. You guys have a good afternoon. Yep, you good. You too. You too. All right, that's going to do it for our first ever Stuer Crazy podcast. We hope you enjoyed it, and we're going to be doing seasons of these things. So we're going to be doing a, a couple episodes 
uh, in a block and then taking a little bit of a break and doing more episodes as uh, as we get them done. So next week, we are going to talk about doctors and doctors' offices. So we would love for you to come back. Uh, we're going to have some interviews with uh, some folks from Railroad Town, and we're going to just see how well we can do this thing. So we honestly appreciate you coming, uh, uh, listening to this podcast, and we'll be back next week. The Stuart Crazy Podcast is a product of Stuart Museum. You can find more about our museum at stewartmuseum.org. Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and tell other people about the podcast. We appreciate you listening.